really doesn't get talked at all about. And that's burnout for dog breeders. You might be thinking, that doesn't happen, or you've never heard about it. And that's because you probably never have heard about it. Us dog breeders, especially those of us who really, truly care about the breed, are drowning head, you know, we are head deep, you know, actually just absolutely drowning in information and health testing and research and just every bit of information we can regarding our breed, our dogs, better breeding, other breeders, clients, vets, research. I mean, you name it, we, we're in it. And for me, my breed, it just seems we're in a tailspin right now. And breeders are just button heads. There's a huge split in the Doberman world. There's European versus American. This never should have happened. If you go back to the original standard, it is Doberman. It is the Doberman Pinscher. Over time, just for sake of convenience, the term Pinscher was dropped in conversation and articles. But per the standard, it is the Doberman Pinscher, the German standard, the original, the original standard when it was written, when the first standard was written up by the German Kennel Club, it was the Doberman Pinscher. Now, that aside, this split between the European Doberman and the American Doberman never should have happened. This has led to a conflict to this one versus the other. It is one breed, it is one dog, it is one universal standard. When you breed the standard, the only difference between the KC standard, the Euro quote unquote, European standard, and the American standard, with minimal variances between weight and height allotment, very minimal, that doesn't affect the breed. <laughs> The only difference is the KC does not allow for dilutes, the Fonz of Blues, while the American Standard does. That is the only difference. A dilute can still be registered in the KC, but it is not accepted in the show ring, nor is it promoted to be bred. It should not be bred according to their standards. In the American Standard, it is allowed to be bred, it is allowed to be shown, and it can be titled um, the KC, it cannot. Um, that aside. This split, the big blocky Euro and the thin refined American, both of those extremes are unacceptable in the breed. I, as a breeder, and in, in my stance for promoting the breed, stand in between this American versus Euro. It's crap, guys. It's crap. Really. When we're looking at the breed, there should never be this type of split. The Doberman, as a breed, is a Doberman. That originated as a European-based breed. They were brought to America as war dogs, as working dogs. You know, they are, by default, a European breed, a German breed. Today's split between European versus American, the, in my opinion, my professional breeder opinion is completely, totally unexpect, un, unacceptable. And good breeding practices should not be American versus Europe. The way they have been bred has produced these subpopulations, these pockets of genetics, which has further just bottlenecked our brain. The Doberman is in this horrible genetic state where they're severely inbred. And if you're sitting back saying, nope, nope, they're not. They're healthy. No, they're not. Look at the longevity. Go to the Russian database, the Russian Doberman database. It'll tell you the longevity. They've done an excellent job tracking their longevity. You guys, those Russian Doberman, average longevity, six years old. That's not healthy. Main cause of death, DCM and cancer. Guys, you're your quote unquote European Doberman. You're inbreeding them 40 to 50% inbred. 
that's extremely high. Most acceptable inbreeding ratios for purebred dogs is in the 20s. And as a breeder and as somebody who's been researching population genetics and been talking with a lot of these canine geneticists and researchers, that's way too high. Any inbreeding ratio that high, above 20 is ridiculous. Anything above 20 starts affecting longevity and just general health. You get, a, you get lower um, fertility rates, you get smaller litter sizes, you just start seeing significant health issues. And the Doberman's average COI, coefficient of inbreeding, or inbreeding ratio, is 43%. Come on guys, as breeders, how are you not seeing this? And here I am sitting, busting my butt, day in, day out, my, my head's in the books, I'm pulling up pedigrees from, I'm not kidding, the 1800s guys, I'm going back to the 1800s when our breed was founded, I'm looking back at these dogs, I'm looking for lines that are still floating out there, I'm trying to find dogs that still have lines that haven't died out, trying to find something, something that we can still draw on and build back. Where are you? Where's somebody else out there like me who is sitting up doing this? I found three other breeders out there who are racking through pedigrees, who are talking to others out, other geneticists, who are going beyond just putting two dogs together, who are just, who aren't looking at just a five generation, eight generation pedigree, who are going literally beyond what they have to as a breeder so that we can keep our breed alive. If we don't change what we're doing, we're gonna lose this breed. Six years longevity is not enough to sustain. And even if we can, in two, three generations, lower our COI, how long can we sustain that before we run into the same problem? We start running out of genetics to keep it afloat, to keep enough diversity to where we can maintain healthy dogs. Guys, we gotta do something. Focusing on this European versus American split is just going to further create an issue. It's one breed. Good breeders breed not only for type, which is what your European is, or American, that's for type. That's for look. There's more to the dog than just that. A European Doberman is a gorgeous representation of the breed bred right. They should not be this 120 pound dog. Guys, that's not a Doberman. Read the standard. If you want a Doberman, you should want a Doberman for what its standard was bred for. Not for this massive oversized dog. If you want a 120 pound dog with a blocky head, blocky structure, oversized massive paws, get a Mastiff. Get a Great Dane. Although the Great Danes really should not be bred that way too. Look at a Cane Corso. Look at the Mastiff breeds. Those are big dogs. They have drive. You can get dogs like that with cropping. You can get a dog that's oversized with or massive size, sorry. That fits exactly what you're looking for. That's not a Doberman. That's not sacrificing the breed that I love so much. And will get you a dog that you like. Don't hurt my breed because you want something outside my standard, outside my breed standard. Don't hurt my breed because you want something that doesn't match what my breed is supposed to be producing. This is all ranting while I'm driving to my doctor appointment, by the way. This is what I do. This is how I spend my day. This is what I think about. This is why I keep hitting burnouts. Breeders like me spend so much time really, truly trying to save this breed. I know there's other breeders out there. And if you're another breeder who is spending your time just thinking about this stuff and really thinking you're the only one out there, DM me, reach out to me, email, you know, just hit me up anytime because I'm out here you know floating around Indiana floating around the Midwest trying to reach out find other breeders who are willing to work on a breeding program that will save this breed you know breeding for preservation is not easy and it takes an effort amongst you know many other breeders nobody is my competition that's not how breeding should work this should be a way for us to network together and you know this is about the dogs. It's about the breed. So, so if you're sitting back 
you're burnt out, you feel like you're exhausted trying to think through these dogs and trying to work for it, you're not alone. But for the breeders who are burnt out, who do sit back and just feel absolutely overwhelmed with the information or feel like you're getting nowhere, it happens. Take a break, take a step back. You know, it's gonna take time for us to, to work through with these dogs. And you know, unfortunately with the Doberman, we may not. I mean, 50 some percent inbred. I, I have the copies of the paperwork for these dogs. I have the copy of their genetic testing. I have the copy of their their pedigrees, their their actual genetic results. 50 some percent inbred is going to be extremely difficult to revive the genetics that they have bred away for so long. It's really going to take a long time. Um, we we literally breeders have bred out so much of the actual diversity we once had we probably will not be able to, to bring any of that back. Most of it is gone. Most of that original genetics, what we have is just poof, gone. Um, the line breeding, the inbreeding, the kennel to kennel to kennel, the same dog, the same dog, the, the popular sires, the popular dams, the popular kennel to popular kennel that has just kept those same names, those same dogs, those same genetics. And by doing that, you've discarded the, and ignored the rest. There's only so much of that you can work with until you've just eliminated all other possibilities. And you can only work with that for so long until there's just not enough to sustain. That's like using the same bits of water. Eventually, there's just not enough to use to keep the plant alive. But there are ways to revive a breed that involves different types of breeding programs outcrossing. There's a program called LUA that the Dalmatian program used to correct a genetic fault, a single gene fault. Um, that's a whole other topic. I would love to see that in the Doberman breed. I'm a huge supporter of that in the Doberman breed. Fresh new genetics, but DPCA is not a fan of that. They want their purebreds kept purebreds, and while it is still purebred, open up the stud books, guys. But, oh well. Um, we can still work with what we got within the Doberman, but we'll see. So other breeders, don't get too burnt out. There are those of us, like me, and like those few other breeders I have found, or have found that truly care about the breed, who spend a lot more time than you would ever think thinking about the breed, thinking about these dogs, and just trying to really stay afloat and trying to keep this breed afloat. Trust me, I don't make money at this. People think I do, but for what I do, the amount of time I spend in this, no. Guys, I'm driving a 2006 Kia Sportage. Look at this. This ain't, this isn't much. I'm not in it to make a buck. I'm in this seriously to try to preserve and save a breed that I feel like I have a personal dedication to. There's just something about this breed that has become such a part of my identity that I can't see myself doing anything else other than working with these dogs educating others about them and advocating for this breed um, and advocating for dogs in general even if i wasn't a breeder even if i wasn't producing litters i would still be working with doberman and doberman breeding programs i would still be trying to work with canine research researchers and genome projects i just love it i like working with it but it, it's also very disheartening when you look at the numbers and you look at all the information out there and how easy it is to get a hold of it. And yet people just turn a blind eye or just not even naiveness, it's just true, just stubbornness or just blatant that people just don't want to do it. And that's what's gotten me down lately is people just, these breeders just absolutely refuse to accept the facts. and. Doing that, continuing to do that, will destroy the screen. The numbers are there. There is so much research at this point 
that it's almost like confetti. I can just throw it at you all day long and just rain down millions of little pieces of paper thrown at you. But ramblings of a breeder driving to a doctor's appointment because I see specialists that when you're a chronic a chronic spoonie, you have you get used to your doctors being an hour, two hours away. This is what you do. You talk to your phone that's strapped to the dashboard and you just drive. So, so my ramblings for the day are burnout and hoping that there's other breeders out there on social media that might see this little video and think, hey, I feel the same way too. Maybe I'll reach out to this person and there might be another breeder that I can network with and say, well, let's talk a breeding program and let's see what you got and let's look at your program, your dogs, and, you know, what it can contribute to, you know, the diversity projects we got going and, you know, where your dog would fit in because more dogs actually fit into a diversity project than you realize. We need more dogs. We need more breeders. We don't need more bad breeders, though. We need more people willing to put in the work to do this right. You can have a dog that's titled and fancy and looks great, and it absolutely would destroy the breed. And that's what's happened. That's why our breed is so devastated right now. Because those big kennels with their fancy dogs that they bred, you know, uncle to niece to cousin to aunt to sister back to brother to whatever. That screwed up this breed. How did you think that wouldn't? You know, the same dog appearing in the pedigree six times? You think that wasn't gonna cause problems? Common sense. That doesn't work. We know that doesn't work. You know that didn't work back then. You, and, and then the common, the thing I'm hearing lately, BWD doesn't cause problems. Anytime you have a bleeding disorder, you are at risk. At risk doesn't necessarily mean you're in active disease all the time. I have a bleeding disorder. Just because I get a bruise doesn't mean I'm going to bleed out and die. But it does mean I'm at risk. For the sake of your clients, the sake of setting a foundation for your dogs, you don't breed at risk dogs. It's as simple as a $45 test through Gensel. And bam, you can avoid breeding a disease risk dog. And yes, it has to do with just how the penetrance and all that and, you know, the plasma, VWF and all that. You, you can test how, how affected your dog is. I know. I've had a VWD affected dog before. And unfortunately, he was severely affected. One little nick on his ear and he would bleed and bleed and bleed and it, it was a mess. And I've known people who had VWD affected dogs who did not have severe bleeding episodes. But why as a breeder would you take a risk when you can avoid that? That doesn't make sense to me. There should never be a reason in today's age for you to breed an affected dog when you can avoid it. There's plenty, to, plenty of dogs out there be able to avoid that. And if you try to justify breeding a BWD dog, I want to metaphorically smack you because there's there really is no reason. That is an actual genetic disease. We know it's a genetic disease. And to say, oh, well, they're mildly affected. They're moderately affected. They're not really affected. They're they're not clinically affected. It is a genetic disease and you cannot pre-breeding say how affected your puppies are going to be. I don't want to hear it. So don't. As a breeder, as a buyer, don't buy a dog from a breeder that's breeding BWD to BWD. If you're a new breeder and you made that mistake and you didn't know or you were like many other young breeders and you were taught that you can breed carrier to carrier because they're mildly affected or they the litter won't have clinical symptoms and you were misled by other breeders, I am so sorry that somebody misled you. And you need to
to educate yourself and you need to educate your clients on the potential risks that BWD can have. And it can have lifelong risks. Most dogs only have one major bleeding episode in their life and with proper vet care, proper medications, and proper training as an owner, BWD can be managed. And your dog can have a normal lifespan. With surgeries, let your vet know. You can have an easy enough surgical regimen. Your dog may need blood transfusions. Your dog may need additional care during its surgery or aftercare. You know, your dog is going to be at a risk with surgery or trauma. Your dog gets hit by a car and has BWD. There is an additional risk with bleeding. I, I know how this works. I'm a breeder. I've seen the numbers. I've talked to my vets. I've researched it. I've butted heads with people trying to be the stubborn one thinking that I knew better than my vets. And you know what? I didn't. I learned. And I'm not one that's going to sit back and say, your breeder knows better. Because your breeder's not a vet. Your vets go to school. Your the people around you should be your support team. And my vets, I love. I trust them. My vets save my dogs when they do something stupid and decide to eat things that they shouldn't. Or when there's an accident. Or in the event I have a pissed off neighbor who thinks that they know better and does something to try to harm my dogs. Or if there's an accidental ingestion of poison or you name it. If there's something that happens and there's an emergency, I know I can trust my vets. I can call my vet and ask him about a study and they can talk to me. And I like that. I can trust my vet to give me accurate information and if they don't know something, they tell me. And if I find a vet that I don't feel we have a good working relationship with, I am usually honest and forward with them and say, you know, I don't think this is the best client relationship, client blah, blah, blah. And we either keep it just a professional, you know, everyday vaccines type of stuff, or I find a different vet. You know, as a breeder, I'm not a vet. I have my specialties. You know, I work with dogs. I have my certificates. I have my trainings. I have my degrees, but I'm not a clinical practicing vet. I let my vets tell me things. I let my vets teach me things. I rely on them. Dog breeders. You're not vets. You're not canine nutritionalists. You don't know how to do raw feeding. You don't know how to plan your dog's diet. You are hurting your pets. You are hurting your clients by trying to do things outside your realm of expertise. But your vet is also not a breeder. Your vet may be a breeder. I don't know. Most vets are not. In most cases, if your vet is open to talking with you and acknowledge, and you're open to a professional relationship with them, my vet knows that when I talk to them about a newborn puppy I'm struggling with, that we can have an open dialogue about what I expect out of a puppy and what I expect out of my dogs and what type of care I'm hoping to get. And we can map out a, a good plan of action. If you think you're better than your vet and you're trying to do everything on your own, you're doing no good. And if you're doing the same thing with your clients, if you're acting better than everybody else, and if you're acting haughty, if you think you're better than every other breeder, you're not going to get anything done. You're not going to be benefit anybody else. You're just hurting everybody. And a lot of breeders are doing that right now. You, see, you get on social media and they're attacking each other. Why? I don't get this, guys. And then your clients see that, and then future puppy buyers see that, and then future people, just people in general see that. How is that making a good presentation of breeders, of just general canine advocacy? They're, if somebody were to come to my kennel page, they're gonna find a bunch of information, just general education, training tips, a heck of a lot about the breed, a heck of a lot on just education. That's what we're here for. We're here to educate. We're not here to tear people down. So, 
So that's that. I could keep going, I could keep ranting, but I'm about to hit my exit. So I'm gonna need to pop off here and just go do my stuff with my doctors here. So, so breeders, you need help, you need advice, you need someone to give you some care, shoot me a message. I'm here. Anybody interested in Doberman? I'm your person. I know as much as I can know about Doberman. If there's new information out there, I'm one of the first to know about it. Um, I know about as much as I can, and if I don't know something, I will find it for you. If you know something I don't know, I want to know. So let me let me know. And if you just want to have an open dialogue about something, um, I'm not one to attack you. I would rather know. Um, I will be the safe space that most people will never find, <laughs> generally, in the dog world. Um, I and a few other breeders are trying to change that. So if you've not had a good environment and you're looking for a mentor, you're looking for somebody just for general information, or you're just looking for somewhere safe to discuss things, um, uh, go ahead and hit me up. I'm, I'm your person. I like to talk, I like to educate, so if you, if you need somebody safe, who's going to give you the facts. If I think you're wrong about something, I'll tell you, but I'm also going to tell you nicely. I'm never going to make you feel bad about yourself, so if you need help, if you need somebody to talk to, let me know.